I'd like to uh, firstly acknowledge uh, the land from which um, I join you today, my ancestral lands of the Wurundjeri people. I pay my respects to my ancestors and to my elders, as well as to the elders of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations right across the continent. I also welcome uh, SNAKE's Chair, Animiral Bamblett, and the other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders who are with us today including the members of the National Family Matters Campaign Leadership Group. We have some parliamentarians from around the country with us today, and I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out of your busy day to join us. And I'd like to acknowledge the member organisations of Family Matters Strategic Alliance, which now numbers just short of 200 organisations from across uh, Australia, and in particular, our key sponsors. And a special thanks to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander carers and family members, and also to any child and family service practitioners who have joined us today. So today we'll be hearing from the um, Aboriginal Children's Commissioners for the three jurisdictions that have currently been dedicated Aboriginal uh, Children's Commissioners. So I welcome Commissioners April Laurie from South Australia, Commissioner Justin Muhammad from Victoria, and Commissioner Natalie Lewis from Queensland. So thank you for being here today to share your perspective on how dedicated commissioners for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children can help ensure accountability for our children and families in the child protection and out-of-home care system. Um, just a few words with, regarding this um, online launch. So we are recording this launch and it will be uploaded to the Family Matters and Snake YouTube channels later. We're also live streaming right now on the Family Matters Facebook page. And we do encourage you to keep your videos on during the launch. And if you're on a computer or laptop and you can't set your screen to gallery view by clicking um, in the top right hand side. So there's um, a button up there. You can also add your name um, and your, your organization's name, uh, your pe or your people by clicking the three dots on the top right hand side of the screen. We encourage you to use full names and if you're representing an organisation or community, please include that um, with your name. The chat function will be on throughout this event so that you can message our tech support, um, Zareen and Afsar. And if you're having any issues getting settled in later, I'll, um, I'll call for questions uh, a bit later from the audience. And you can write your questions in the chat and I'll get to as many as we can. I'll be keeping to very strict timelines today so that our commissioners can share as much as possible of their views with us. So we'll have a strict allocation of time for each question to the panellists um, and that they're sort of being timed because we've got such a short amount of time we want to get the most out of them. Um, so I'm here today because after more than 20 years working with our families and children, uh, first with VACRA and now with SNAKE, the National Voice of our children. I know that all too often our children and young people and our families fail through the gaps in a complex system with state and federal laws of government providing funding to different services. So our children get lost within these systems and more importantly lost to the families and communities. We need to build accountability and oversight for services and systems to protect the rights of our kids and their families and to ensure that children grow up with the knowledge that their identity as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, children is a source of strength, not deficit, and pride, not shame. So first, I'd like to introduce our three commissioners. April Laurie, Commissioner for Aboriginal Children and Young People in South Australia. So in December 2018, April Laurie was appointed to the inaugural Commissioner for Aboriginal Children and Young People by the South Australian Government. Commissioner Laurie is to develop policies and practices to improve the safety and well-being of Aboriginal children and young people, particularly in the areas of health, education, youth justice and child protection. Commissioner Laurie is a proud Aboriginal woman and heralds from the Mearing and Gagartha people from the far west coast of South Australia. I really hope I got that right because I did ask you. Commissioner Laurie holds a social work degree which led her to a range of executive leadership roles in South Australian government agencies, including four years at the Aboriginal Justice Director in the Attorney General's Department, 10 years as the South Australian Health Aboriginal Health Branch Director, and two and a half years as Director of Aboriginal Education. 
So over the last 30 years, Commissioner Laurie has contributed to the formation of policy at the state and national level, an excellence in service, innovation and community development with regards to Aboriginal health, education, family, uh, child and family services, foster care services, justice services across the metropolitan and regional area, including rural and remote. Commissioner Laurie strongly believes that we need to bring the voice of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people and their communities into how we design and deliver health, education, justice and child protection systems and services that Aboriginal children and young people can flourish. The Commissioner believes that to improve services and outcomes, we need to recognise the solutions coming from our Aboriginal communities and families and act upon them in a meaningful way. April lives in Adelaide and is married and has three children and she's currently in lockdown and her little granny may run in at some time, so it's <laughs> part of COVID, I guess. Next, we'll introduce Commissioner Justin Muhammad, the Victorian Commissioner for Aboriginal Children and Young People. Um, Justin is a Gurren Gurren man from Bundaberg in Queensland who currently is the Commissioner for Aboriginal Ch Children and Young People of Victoria. He has worked with the Victorian Aboriginal communities for 20 years before moving to Canberra to take on a national position as chairperson of the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation and Chief Executive Officer of Reconciliation Australia. And prior to his move to Canberra, Justin held positions based in the Shepparton region as the inaugural director of the Academy of Sport, Health and Education, CEO and later chairperson of Rumbalara Aboriginal Corporation, or Cooperative Limited, sorry. And he chaired the Victorian Aboriginal Community Controlled Organisation, so that show, and chaired the Hume Regional Aboriginal Justice Advisory Council. And Justin has held positions on multiple community, state, and national working groups, uh, committees, and boards, and continues to be a director of Supply Nation, co chair of Cricket Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Committee, and board member of, and I hope I pronounce it right, Kayali Institute. And we also have Natalie Lewis, who's appointed Commissioner for the Queensland Family and Child Commission. And in May of 2020, so this year, uh, Natalie is a Gamilaroi woman and has a wealth of experience and knowledge from a distinguished over 20 year career in youth justice, child and family services and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs. Previously, Natalie held the role of Chief Executive Officer with Quatsit Limited and was a snake board member for over eight years. She also served as the co-chair of the Family Matters campaign. So I've got a big shoes to fill there. And as commissioner, Miss Lewis drives change to better the safety, well-being and interests of children and young people, including those in the child protection system. So now we're gonna hear from the commissioners, uh, Commissioner Laurie, Commissioner Lewis and Commissioner Muhammad about their views on how to achieve this kind of oversight and accountability to protect the rights of our children and families in the child protection system. So we're going to start off with myself asking them questions. Um, and at the end, uh, we will have time for um, any other questions through the chat. Um, so I will start with um, April. Um, tell us what personally motivated you to want to be a children's commissioner. Yeah, I'll start. Yeah. Yep. So I think for me, it's actually being an Aboriginal person immersed in my own identity and my Aboriginal heritage with strong family and community um, ties and st being strongly connected to country, yet being part of a generation that felt the brunt of the last wave of overt government assimilation policy. I mean, it's covert now, but you know. However, resisting that, um, that brunt and wanting to make things better than what my mum and my grandparents and great grandparents and ancestors experienced at the hands of, um, you know, colonization, uh, white settlers and government that's what motivates me, I guess. And I want to make a contribution to stop that intergenerational effects of colonisation trauma and stop further stolen generations and keep our Aboriginal children connected to families and culture. And at the heart of that motivation is Aboriginal self-determination. We need to take control of our Aboriginal destinies, especially that of our children and young people. So an essay, when that role um, was out there and advertised for the Aboriginal Children's Commissioner, I applied without hesitation. I knew that I had the credentials and professional qualifications, the Aboriginal mainstream credibility, and above all 
people I had, um, you know, cultural integrity to undertake the role. And all that, I want to make a difference and be difference, be the difference in the care and protection systems. I've been working, as you said, you know, in my bio in government for close to 30 years, working in Aboriginal child protection and foster care services early in my career, then going to health and education and justice. Um, and over that period of time, I saw a continual failure of, you know, government policy and programs addressing issues for Aboriginal children and young people and saw that Aboriginal leadership and voice was far too often marginalised. I saw Aboriginal engagement lacking, if not undermined and misappropriated. And to top it off, I saw, you know, like the travesty of injustice to Aboriginal people in the very service system trying to change our Aboriginal outcomes. Undeniably, it's Aboriginal leadership for Aboriginal children and young people that will, you know, drive the changes um, that we, you know, are looking for. Aboriginal people are invested in our Aboriginal children and young people like no other. That's me and that's what motivates me. Thank you, April. Um, Justin. Yeah, um, thank you, um, Sue Ann. Um, before I start, I just want to acknowledge traditional lands which we're meeting on and um, the country which I'm meeting on down here in, um, in Melbourne where I'm still working from home like many of others um, people. Um, the, the, the Rundry people of the Kulin Nation and to pay my respects to elders past and present and merging. I don't think any of us really woke up one day and said we want to aspire to be commissioner for <laughs> Aboriginal children and young people because this, these are fairly new roles that have, have been established. Victoria was the lead um, in that. Um, but I think my, in my, in my um, I suppose my journey, it's, I, I was very fortunate to work, as you mentioned, in an organisation called Rumble R Aboriginal Cooperative. And in Victoria, the cooperatives are very holistic. They run a whole lot of different programs. Not, not just one, from everything from housing to health to children's services to aged care, a list goes on. Um, and in that organisation that I spent a number of years with, I really learned that uh, I got a really good lesson about how holistic it all links them together. Just um, having strong elders doesn't just mean working with elders, you've got to have strong families. Having strong children, you need strong parents. There's a whole range of things that interconnect. And then if we look at the future of where we go, we know that the next generation has to be equipped and be strong and be resilient to be able to reach their full potential. And um, my very first role that I had was I was a youth um, justice worker and that kind of gave me a real um, connection to young people and some of the struggles that they're going with. And as we know, a number of young people that are in the youth justice system come with child protection backgrounds. So once I started meeting with their carers or their um, kinship carers and their parents, finding that about how their lives are, just as a young, a young person, um, nearly 30 years ago now, um, just being seen that if we can get this right in, in um, young people's lives, that's going to pave a really big path for us to be able to, to move ahead as, an, um, as Aboriginal people as an, um, in this country. So that's what inspired me right throughout my career. I kept on being connected back to young people. And can I say, Working with young people is the most inspirational and they just re, you know, energise you when you get the chance to meet with them and be with them. And they show more resilience than so many other people, you know, so many other areas that say we can't do it. Young people seem to be able to just to keep moving through and, they, and that's um, basically what inspires me and keeps me going to be committed and passionate to um, you know, be an advocate and give them a voice um, in this pretty hostile environment which many of them are in. Thank you. Thanks so much, Justin. Um, so, uh, Natalie, what's motivated you to go into your role? Um, thanks, Wen. Um, I just want to acknowledge that, um, you know, today I'm, uh, we're broadcasting from, but also that I live and work on the lands of the Yagra people. Um, and I just want to extend my gratitude to all of the people that have logged in here today um, for your enduring commitment to our children and, and families. Um, I guess it, it's 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 an odd thing for me being on here, like in terms of I had a long-term um, and continuing commitment to family matters. And probably those that know me best had, you know, had uh, two years ago 
we had a, a discussion about me being a children's commissioner. Um, it would have been a very colourful conversation and I don't think that it was necessarily on, on the horizon. Um, it's no secret that I've been pretty critical um, of commissions um, generally and about the lack of, you know, a child rights um, agenda in this country. And um, so if I kind of flip that on its head, that's probably what then ended up pushing me over the line and made me, um, you know, really think that um, I could sit, I could sit and complain about it for the next, you know, three to five years, or I could actually try and create an impact. And um, and certainly, what I've found since I've been at the QFCC is that there is no shortage of commitment and there's no shortage of talent, you know, and that that vision around the rights of our children um, is a shared one. And so I think through, um, you know, me becoming a, a children's commissioner, I guess it's, you know, putting me into um, different spaces than I've been before. Um, you know, I've had to kind of start to very quickly develop some other ways of getting my point across. Um, but um, I'm still the same person and still firmly committed to the very same things um, that I have always been committed to um, since the first real job I ever had, which was 25 years ago, working in the deaths and custody monitoring unit um, here in Queensland. So um, hopefully that's answered the question. Yeah, it definitely has. Thank you. Um... Yeah, great answers. I think you can see you've all come up through the, you know, the the justice sort of um, childcare system in some way, shape, or form to get to where you are, um, and your commitment um, just shines through. I guess the next question we've got for you all is: Can you briefly explain your role? And the reason we're asking this is because you're in each each in different states, and it may look different in that state. So, um, Justin, would you like to go first? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty hard to briefly explain the roles because there's so much um, attached to them. But in Victoria, uh, th this particular role, the first commissioner, Andrew Giacomos, the inaugural commissioner, was appointed in 2013. And so that was, you know, well and truly established in around 2012 that he came into 2013. There was a bit of a trailblazing sort of role. There wasn't other commissioners of that sort around in other states and territories. Um, to the extent that um, when he came in. So Victoria in some ways, I think, um, you know, showed that we there needs to be a dedicated person focusing just on Aboriginal children and young people in a, in a broader context of children and young people. So the, the commission in um, Victoria, we are a little bit different to other states. We have an oversight over both youth justice, child protection, education and health to a lesser degree, but still oversight on those both both of those key areas of youth justice and child protection, which are probably the two biggest areas where our children are involved in within um, government systems. In, in those spaces, we have, um, as I said, let's say oversight. Um, we have a number of different functions that we have powers to do, which we call powers, but we can do individual um, inquiries of individual children, which we believe the system or the services that are there aren't um, being, you know, be, um, aren't be, um, giving the best interest of the child at heart and their care and protection is at jeopardy. Um, so individually do inquiries, which then get tabled um, to minister, ministerial level or straight to government. The other area of inquiries, which we tend to kind of work on a lot more of, is systemic inquiries about how, how the system is working and what changes there may be. And that may be a statewide or that may be of a particular area or region. So there, it's, it's um, you know, it, it can be many and, ver and very. The, the beauty about what well, our powers that we do have when we complete these inquiries, they get tabled directly in Parliament and um, something which from an advocacy point where most of my life is spent, it's quite refreshing to know that what you write and what you're finding in your recommendations can be tabled directly to Parliament and they have to be tabled. So it's not hoping that government will listen to you, they will have to receive them at least and then work from there. Um, the other parts, which is the other part of our work that we do, it's um, the, and it's like, like most areas and most commissions, but in the commission, in the commission of Victoria, the, the networking and partnership with the service providers, the community control um, organisations, which are really taking leaps and bounds of the, uh, moving into this responsibility of caring and protecting our children in ways way more um, than ever before. Um, and also, and the um, other um, 
community organisations which are out there and departments through ministers, um, DEPSECs and secretaries. The, um, and on top of all that, we, and as, as my, in my role, um, with all the government types of meetings you can go to, um, we also um, um, in, interact with the community themselves face to face. And that could be with individual carers, um, grandparents, it could be with groups, it could be with a whole region. Um, with youth groups or individual young people. And that moves, moves through a number of different mechanisms, which gives us the information and the, um, the findings that we can advocate effectively on behalf of children and young people. So that's um, probably in a nutshell what we do um, in saying that um, our relationships is probably the key thing with this, because we know that we've got to make sure that we're all working towards the same goal. And in our role as a, a, a monitoring these and being an oversight body is, to ensuring that whatever's going on outside of it, that children and young people and Aboriginal children and young people in my role have the highest status and is, is the core function of um, the role that I have is representing them for first and foremost, then everything else then flows um, and, and falls in behind that. So hopefully that answered it. Yeah, thank you, Justin. I know you, there's so much so much you, you do there that trying to fit it in a short amount of time, but thank you. I think you've got a lot in there. Um, Natalie. Yep, sure. The QFCC is a statutory body. Um, so it was established in 2014 and um, as a result of the Carbony reforms um, in Queensland, uh, the Queensland Child Protection uh, Commission of Inquiry. Um, so obviously there's intricacies in, in the legislation, but, um, but the roles of commissioners in, in Queensland are legislated roles. It is also a legal requirement that one of those roles um, be um, held by an Aboriginal or Torres Strait, Torres Strait Islander person. Um, there is um, functions you, uh, basically um, oversighting of the child protection system, um, also um, advocating and you know, promoting the safety and well-being um, of all children in Queensland. Um, we have, you know, a role in performing systemic oversight. So there's a bit of a distinction in terms of some of the um, scope of our role as opposed to what Justin's just described in that we don't um, receive complaints or initiate inquiry in relation to individual children. So um, we've recently just um, gone through a, you know, strategic plan re refresh, you know, um, and as an agency are very, very clear that our core functions are awareness advocacy and accountability. And um, I think we're well positioned to do that. We also have an opportunity, you know, sort of um, coming up soon, I'm hoping, um, in that our legislation is, is due to be reviewed. Um, so we can actually look at what are the existing limitations within the legislation and, um, and look to strengthen those so that we can absolutely be the premier advocacy and oversight agency in this state um, as, it, as it pertains to children's rights. So um, we obviously provide advice. Um, we make submissions about um, national and, and state policy and legislative um, reform. Um, but um, the most, I guess, the most important thing that we do is that we listen to young people. Um, and, uh, you know, a commission that doesn't do that is not an authentic commission. And, um, and I think that for us, first and foremost, we need to honour, um, you know, the, the voices of children. Um, and we need to make sure that um, the agenda that we um, are pursuing is absolutely um, embedded in, in the pursuit of their rights and their best interests. So, um, yeah, that's our role. Thanks. Thanks, Natalie. Um, done well explaining in a short amount of time for being there. It's in a short amount of time. So thank you. Um, April. Um, thank you. So I think we know that I started in the role in October 2018. Um, that's when I was formally appointed under the Constitution Act of South Australia. Um, but I didn't start until December 2013, um, yeah, 2018. The origins of my role stem from, you know, I have to give credit to my Aboriginal community here. It's, you know, the lobbying over the many years in response to the history of Aboriginal child removals and was considered later in the 2003 um, Leighton Review, which was a state plan to protect and advance the interests of children. And the role later gained momentum as a result of the South Australian Child Protection Systems Royal Commission. Um, and in its final report, um, the commission recommended that amongst oversight bodies, 
an independent Children's Commission to be established in SA. Now, this role was established in 2017, not my role, the other commissioner role, um, under the Children and Young People's Advocacy and Oversight Bodies Act. Unfortunately, in that act, the Children's Commissioner role did not include scope um, for the appointment of a, of a specific commissioner for Aboriginal children and young people. But the commission did propose that the Children's Commissioner undertake consultation with Aboriginal children and young people. However, um, the role was not intended to have a primary focus on Aboriginal issues. And, like, and that caused disappointment across the Aboriginal community of SA. He'd been advocating for many years um, about a, you know, a lead Aboriginal advocate um, role for our children and young people. It was through a combination of advocacy for Aboriginal people and government's willingness through an election promise that the role was created. Um, and my appointment, I guess, to the role, if, you know, reflected a bipartisan, um, bipartisan commitment to positive change for Aboriginal children and young people. My description of current functions is set out in my instrument of appointment. However, in a general sense, I see my role as created to promote the rights, safety, um, development and well-being of Aboriginal children and young people in SA at a systemic level. And that includes interrogating and, ad and addressing systemic issues impacting the safety and well-being of Aboriginal children and young people across health, education, child protection and justice and promoting the voice of Aboriginal children and young people with regard to their, um, you know, to their well-being, and that is also in line with the, the their families and their community. And although I'm currently located um, administratively um, in the office of the Commissioner for Children and Young People, my role and functions are quite independent of the Commissioner for Children and Young People, um, and so our approaches are different. I'm independent from government. Um, and I'm required to provide an annual report to the South Australian Minister for Education in relation to my activities um, in the preceding financial year. I relish my independence. Um, in many ways, I see myself as a challenger and interrogator who provides an important external voice to hold government to account um, with respect to the you know, obligations to Aboriginal children and young people and their families. Um, you know, I've got a number of, you know, requirements under my role um, and I've got, you know, two staff to help me um, discharge my role. And I guess what's really important is that as much as we've got a priority to um, hear directly from Aboriginal children and young people, I'm required to also provide written and oral submissions into inquiries, legislative reforms and departmental proposals, advocate for systemic change in multiple forums at agency, state and national level, campaigning for the development of key initiatives, you know, that embed the voices of our children and their families um, in decisions about their safety and wellbeing. And it's really important that the engagement happens and continues through the, through the agency of our, of our Aboriginal children and young people. Great, thanks April, but I'm gonna ask you the next question straight away, if you're in line. Yep. It's a two part um, question. So what are the most crucial challenges in the child protection and out of home care system that need to be addressed for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families? And the second part to that question is how would you improve the child protection and out of home care system? Or is it a case of complete overhaul? And if so, what would it look like? Oh. <laughs> well, Yes, I know. Um, and I guess this applies to all of us. Um, and, and I'm concerned about government child protection agencies failing to adhere to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child placement principle. I think, you know, that's the um, overwhelming um, message about the challenges. From what I have observed um, here in SA, um, whether it be the child protection agency or the early intervention agencies that have been charged with those responsibilities. We've got a number of resources out there across government and, you know, being filtered through to our Aboriginal community controlled structures. We've got restructuring happening. Um, with, you know, government is developing special policies for Aboriginal children and their families. However, it's missing the mark as there is failure to incorporate the key principle of partnership with our Aboriginal families um, in those decision-making um, forums and um, 
you know, in those decision making elements through our service systems. And I believe that lack of partnership and co-design with the Aboriginal community um, probably needs to be a key part of the reform um, that needs to happen. And, you know, without that reform happening, we're continually failing to keep um, the voices and the participation of our Aboriginal children and families um, in that process. And we know that the, the agency of Aboriginal voice particularly of children and families is very critical to keeping our children connected um, to, to family, community, culture, and obviously identity. So for me, you know, the legislation currently doesn't give effect to the application of all five pillars of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Child Placement Principle. And, um, and I can't see like within our legislation, how it gives proper application in the early intervention space. That's probably the biggest challenge. Um, and, you know, whilst there are reforms currently underway with our ledge and amendments to embed, you know, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Child Placement Principle um, more robustly in there, um, for me, those, that, that's important. However, I've yet to see the reform that deliberately promotes engagement with Aboriginal families and their communities in all levels of decision-making impacting the safety and well-being of our Aboriginal children and young people. But I wanna go back to one of my earlier points and it's a cornerstone point about Aboriginal self-determination. If we have the debate about a complete overhaul, then the conversation needs to include a new Aboriginal service system, including a piece of legislation dedicated explicitly to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people, a dedicated Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child safety strategy and framework, including standards and Aboriginal governance and proper resourcing around the implementation of that legislation and strategy, which includes a national Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lead role. Oops. Sorry, I muted myself. Uh, thank you, um, April. And you did it nicely within the time frame too. So thank you. Um, Justin, would you like me to repeat the question or you're ready to go? Um, I should be right. Um, I should okay. just say ditto to what uh, April said because uh, <laughs> she, she hit a number of these points. That's the, that's the beauty of going first. Yes. <laughs> so um, look, I think um, exactly what April was talking about, but I think there's a core issue which hasn't been fully addressed or, or spoken about. I mean, probably has been spoken about, but when we talk about government, we're talking about the, um, the, the legislation and how child protection out of home care was built upon. It was fundamentally built and our first interaction with this system as Aboriginal people, our children were removed because of their race. And I believe that the institutional racism which that system was built on still needs to have some pretty strong and, and constructive conversations about how do we dis dismantle this and don't think that just putting new things on top of a system is going to fix it, but we've got to dismantle some of the things that have been, got, have been guiding um, out-of-home care ch child protection um, across Australia and obviously in this state here in Victoria. So institutional racism needs to be addressed. Um, I heard a great example, um, which I think kind of typifies why we're still in this space where we've got such a huge over-representation number of Aboriginal children, Aboriginal Torres Strait Island children in out-of-home care and coming into contact and continually come in contact generation after generation. Once the young ones grow up, then their children are coming into connection with that. And the, and the, the example I had uh, well, that was given to me is that um, if anyone ever has grown grapes on trellises, um, they put a trellis down, they put a vine in, and the grape, the vine will grow over that trellis. And um, the trellis, if you see the trellis is seen to be, that was a system that was originally set up Whatever new vines you bring in and use the same trellis, it will take that shape. And, it'll, and I didn't realise this, but if you remove the trellis after a number of years, the vine continues to grow exactly in that same sort of shape. So we've got to, um, I think, address this and, and have these conversations. I know the conversations are have, having the space for it, where departments, government, states, territories, and particularly the Commonwealth, understand that we've got to be truthful about why we've got this um, systemic issue, why we've got such a huge uh, over-representation um, of Aboriginal young people 
in um, the child protection area. And I think it bases on why children were removed from the very early days to where we are now. And moving into what we need to do and what I see is um, the value of um, culture should be, um, I don't think it's seen enough as strength-based. It's kind of seen as either something as um, from the broader Australia, something which is like a, a reward or something exotic, but it is, it needs to be seen as a strength base and it is the foundation of getting our community stronger and our young people and that protective factor. And that, um, that the system and, and society values Aboriginal families, um, values Aboriginal parents, values the, the concept of keeping those together as much as we can. And I, April's words kind of um, went down that I won't, won't repeat that. And the final thing I just want to say is um, consistency. It'd be great to have the whole system right across Australia, but even in state that wherever you are born, whatever, wherever you might unfortunately be in part of child protection out of home care, is that the consistency with legislation and how a child and um, the family are treated and, um, and legislation is upheld is consistent right across this nation. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Right. right. Okay. Um, the first thing I just I, I just want to address. I know their question is specifically about how do we fix the out of home care system. The thing for me is about how do we get rid of overrepresentation, and that is absolutely the focus of Family Matters. And we've got to be really careful to um, to remember that the overrepresentation is actually a litmus test for the success or failure of broader social policy. So when we start to narrow the conversation and we focus only on the statutory child protection system, we actually miss a massive opportunity to promote the safety and well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Um, with regard to the system specifically, um, I think the Family Matters um, uh, roadmap from you know, years ago and um, the recommendations now make that very, very clear that the, the way to reform those systems are to implement each and every one of the four building blocks. Um, the most important um, activity under that for me is around implementation of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child placement principle in a manner consistent with its intent. And I'm talking about all five elements. Um, in Queensland, it's the only jurisdiction to have um, introduced all five elements into the legislation. Um, but we've got a ways to go in terms of um, true accountability uh, for implementation against each of those five elements. Um, I think when we look at the information that's readily available to make a, a call about the you know, performance of a child protection system, um, we're fed with data that is about particular functions. You know? um, if, it's, if it's purely just about reporting the number of removals, gold star, most, of, most systems in Australia are pretty good at doing that. But the purpose is supposed to be about safety and well-being of Aboriginal children. So where is the reporting and the data that actually tells or speaks to the status of well-being and safety of Aboriginal children across this country? And so we need to start to um, push back, um, expect more in terms of the data, um, and also not got tangled up in those discussions about data where it becomes the excuse for inaction. Um, it's very clear what safety feels like, looks like um, to our children and our families. And we need to actually start to introduce measures that reflect the system's capacity to deliver on those things. Great. Thank you, Natalie. And can I just say you all touched on, you know, the Family Matters report um, and the outcomes that we want, and, and Nat, you just summed it up perfectly, some of the stuff in there, because you know it so well. So I think, you know, the, the working together of Family Matters and, and the commissioners is, um, is going to be a really good thing in the, the fact that we're all pushing the same sort of agenda. So... Um, I'll go back to you, um, Natalie. What are your thoughts about a National Aboriginal Children's Commissioner role and how do you think it could best work? What are your bottom lines for an effective national role? Okay, um, it's gonna come as no surprise, but um, I think the, you know, the scale and the significance of the issues that are impacting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in this country warrants an unapologetic focus um, um, and the independence to drive an explicit child rights agenda for First Nations children. So um, while we can, you know, see that, you know, there are some current and even previous reforms, um, you know, at the Commonwealth level and, and at a jurisdictional level, um, there's no single point of accountability. There's no one to connect the dots and to actually make sure that regardless of where that reform is taking place, 
um, that they are front and centre focused on um, the the uh, capacity of that particular reform to promote the, the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. I worry because a lot of the time our kids actually get, well, if not buried, but I guess made invisible in, in large scale reform agendas and for the best of intentions and commitments of people, um, you know, that sat around the table for a long period of time progressing the national framework for protecting Australia's children. Um, inevitably, it is an all children um, approach. And, and while we see it as the most compelling um, crisis in, in our country, being the overrepresentation of our kids in statutory systems, um, there, there's, there's not enough time on the agenda, there's not enough um, effort and resources that can be ch channeled into specifically focusing on improving outcomes for our kids. And so um, I think it's really important uh, for, in terms of non-negotiables, that there is statutory independence. They absolutely need to have own motion powers. They need to be able to um, establish, um, uh, you know, formal relationships with the, net the growing network of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander commissioners across um, the country. And we need to actually, um, you know, work far more cooperatively to actually um, bring accountability for the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's sad that there's all this sort of disengagement as soon as, you know, largely at the Commonwealth level, when we start to talk about rights, um, there's an uncomfortability with that type of language. Um, but me personally, I can't sit through another embarrassing performance like the last um, periodic review of Australia's performance in terms of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. So while we're in positions where we can make a difference, we should absolutely do so. Well, thanks, um, Natalie. I feel like clapping after you guys speak. It's just great um, to hear. Um, Justin, what are your thoughts around the National um, Commissioner role? You're on mute too, by the way. I have got a dollar for every time someone said that to me. I'm on mute um, during this time. Um, look, I... As soon as I came into this role and started to understand what you could do in this space and having a focused um, voice of, with independency um, and a voice directly to a whole lot of different levels of um, government in, in the state of Victoria, my mind went straight to that we need a national commissioner um, focused solely on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people. Uh, there is no doubt about it. Um, I know that there's other commissioners um, that have focuses within the Aboriginal space but if children and young people are our biggest population pool and they're solely so overrepresented in a number of different areas, why wouldn't we have someone which is 100% focused on this, you know, this cohort? And, um, and I know that there's a bit of a pushback, can be pushed back to say, well, a lot of these responsibilities rely in overrepresentation, rely within state jurisdictions, but we need someone, we need a position at a national level to be able to keep this country um, accountable. And um, Natalie mentioned about the UN, it's quite embarrassing that we've got a country of so much wealth and so much um, advancement, but in this space around Aboriginal children, we fall so far behind in so many different areas, not just in youth justice, not just in child protection, but suicides, a whole range of things which are just devastating. Um, and together with that, there is, um, and, we, and we must realise that there is um, national decisions that are made, there's national laws that have been put into place, there's um, restrictions that come down nationally, um, which affect our families, which then in turn affect our children. So having a commissioner to monitor that, uh, work with hopefully uh, more Aboriginal commissioners within um, states and um, jurisdictions, well, I think we'll be able to provide a, um, a voice and a pointed um, focused view and advocacy for our most vulnerable young people um, in this country. and. Uh, I just think that it's the independency is, is a key. It's access to have a voice and be able to speak when it needs to, and to feed into national decision making around, you know, all children, but particularly Aboriginal children. Right. Thank you, um, Justin. Um, April, and you're on mute. Yeah. Uh, yes. I just um, fix that. Thank you. Um, question to me. Well, I think you'd be able to garner from my input that it's without hesitation that I put my support behind the call for a um, National Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Children's Commissioner. We know from the intergenerational effects of dispossession and poverty and the trauma forced um, 
you know, the trauma of forced family separation and removals has led to our children and young people experiencing compounding levels of disadvantage, not experienced by non-Aboriginal peers, by their non-Aboriginal peoples. So let's remember that this experience is before no others. It's only for Aboriginal children and young people. This is unique to our young fellas. And as I said earlier, we as Aboriginal people are invested in our, our people and our issues, especially our children and young people like no other. It is critical that this role in the event that it's established is independent and has statutory powers and is filled by an Aboriginal person to provide that leadership. Um, you know, and whilst we'd expect, you know, powers commensurate with the National um, Commissioner's role, like we expect it to not be a little black version of it. We understand that the focus and its operations we on matters on, on things that matter to our Aboriginal children and young people. And, you know, as so eloquently said by Natalie and Justin, and it's about our rights for our Aboriginal children, their rights as children and their rights as Aboriginal children. And so, you know, without repeating what um, Natalie and um, Justin have said, we know that a commission at the national level could advocate for the needs and rights and views of our Aboriginal children and young people. But we also need to hold a government and government systems to account and to have accountability in the systems. And that accountability needs to be strengthened at the state level, uh, state and territory levels as well. And so, you know, with the call for a national commissioner um, for Aboriginal children and young people, we'd like to see also that every state and territory has indeed an Aboriginal um, children's commissioner. And I suppose when you look at um, what is out there in our, um, you know, in the public space, the call for a, um, a national um, voice, well, it brings me to what we know, you know, what Patrick Dodson said out of the Bringing Them Home report, we've got unfinished business, but we've also got the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And I just want to take us to a nice little point out of the, the statement that resonates with this message about the call for a um, National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commissioner, is that when we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to our country. We ask for a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. I think that sums it up for me and it really is going back to that cornerstone point that I never ever want to lose and that's about Aboriginal self-determination. Okay, thank you, um, April. Um, this is where I get to put you three on the spot because I've got questions oh. <laughs> from... Um, from the people out there that have been listening. Um, and I guess um, the first question from, um, thanks Michael Curry, is what are some of the hopeful outcomes that we might see for our children in light of the National Partnership Agreement? From the? The National Partnership Agreement? Yeah, closing the gap. Yeah. yeah. Please don't answer all at once because you know. yeah, I'm just writing the question down. So, did I just talk over someone? No. Well, we know, I, I, you know, this is the first time in any NPA that we've seen um, a dedicated target around um, reducing um, the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children out of home care. And a, and a focus on um, the measures around that, which includes obviously the application and adherence of the Aboriginal Trust on a Child Placement Principle. And for me, I think, you know, having spent considerable amount of years in Aboriginal health, that the interaction of a number of targets in that NPA, closing the gap NPA, relate to um, our children and young people's wellbeing. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll get we'll get the dedicated resources, we'll get greater collaboration, um, you know, between Commonwealth and state, but also our Aboriginal community controlled sector in driving the solutions and um, driving um, the outcomes. But that's not about letting um, Mason off the hook. 
I think, um, you know, when, when we talk about Aboriginal community controlled, that doesn't mean that we abrogate, we, we support the abrogation of responsibility from the state because they are still there and they have a legal responsibility to still resource and make a difference um, to the things that impact on our Aboriginal children and young people as well. Um, I don't want to hog up too much space because I can see Natalie there. Thanks. I might go on to another question so we can get through some. And this one um, is from Rachel and it's for Commissioner Lewis and Commissioner Mohammed. They both go, oh. Um, both touched on over-representation of Aboriginal children in the childcare system. Um, do you find that there is a direct correlation between the overrepresentation in the childcare system and the overrepresentation in the juvenile detention rates? Is the overrepresentation more than just a product of institutional racism? Um, I, I might go first, Nat, and then you can you can finish it off. Um, <laughs> can I first say that? The number of children in the youth justice system, Aboriginal children, it, though we're overrepresented, those numbers I think we should be able to manage. I mean, those numbers aren't thousands and thousands of kids. I mean, when you break it down to states and then you break it down to regions, they are connected. And, and I know I'll probably speak more from Victoria, but I know in Victoria there is close to over 80% of all Aboriginal children in the youth justice system or um, have had some child protection experience or are currently in child protection as, as, um, as they are in, the, in both the systems at the same time. So there is a connection, um, short answer. Um, I think that um, the, and racism does play a part, stereotyping plays a part because it's not only the young people, it's their families that are also known to both sides of the system. And um, sometimes they get targeted unfairly and I've seen that happen um, and when they get targeted unfairly the system morphs into this is the projection which you you will go down to which will be you know if it's resi care then where do you go from resi care if you do something it's then remand and then find yourself in the youth justice system on and off over a period of time so there is a, a, a race bias whatever you want to call it which connects those um, young people to the system and that has to be broken and see the strength of the young person, but they definitely are connected. And we're not gonna reduce over-representation in the justice system until we reduce over-representation in um, child protection. Right, thank you, Justin. And you've done a lot of work in, in both sort of areas um, and more so recently juvenile justice. So you can see that on their website. Um, Natalie, did you wanna to add to that or did he say? <laughs> I mean, pretty much covered it. It's, I mean, I think that trajectory is pretty, you know, um, is pretty clear. It's, um, it's, it's very similar in, in terms of our um, data in, in Queensland. Um, but I think that the, the similarities actually occur before that. And that's around the experience of inequity in terms of um, access to um, quality health services, access to um, safe and stable, you know, long-term housing early childhood education, all of those things um, have, uh, when there's, when, when children and families experience inequity in that space, their vulnerability to statutory systems increases. And so in order for us to impact youth justice, we also have to impact the drivers of entry into the child protection uh, system. And, you know, we also need to accept that um, systemic racism is not a figment of the Aboriginal imagination. It happens, it is, it, it is there. And there is absolutely in every state and jurisdiction um, in this country cause to critically review the types of tools, frameworks and um, programs that we, uh, we have incorporated into those systems um, because inherent cultural bias in those is only exacerbating the overrepresentation of our kids in statutory systems. So it, it requires attention and it, and it needs to be addressed. Great. And can I say, we, we also don't afford our vulnerable families um, early intervention, early help services, and divert our children and young people away from the youth justice and the child protection system. Well, that goes into the next question from Emma, Emma um, Bobby Chang Stubbs. There seems to be a focus on First Nations children once they've entered care. Is it the commissioner's role to help prevent First Nations children entering care? I think I think it's everyone's role. Um, I think there's it. Um, I, well, we've got to make sure the children that are in care get the, the level of protection and care and love that they need. 
um, and, they, and, they, and they deserve. But I think we spend a lot of our, a lot of the government resources, a lot of our time resources is, is in that field. And we've got to be able to even that up a lot more. I'm not saying take away from one to the other, definitely not that, but add additional resources in for, um, commun uh, for, for the prevention side of things and working with families and keeping those family units together and strengthen them, which should be done on country and by you know, community leadership and um, self-determination, through the self-determination um, values. Great. Thanks, Justin. Did um, Natalie or April want to um, I think, well, you know, I'm just going to push the Family Matters building blocks again. You know, that's the whole purpose around the universal and targeted supports. And um, and so it is absolutely as an organize as, as a commissioner um, and for us as a QFCC, it is important to, un you know, to understand that if we don't get that part right, if we don't address the inequity in terms of access to those quality services that make the foundations for strong children and families, um, then we're doing a disservice. So I think we've, you know, we've got a really balanced view of what is our role and um, yeah, certainly part of what we do. Yeah, and I agree. And that those early help services um, and how they're delivered culturally appropriately and with the support of our Aboriginal community control sector is critical. And we know that we have to build those therapeutic services, early help services, on Aboriginal ways and knowing to get greater access um, and greater reach across to our, you know, our vulnerable children and their families. Um, so I, I do fierce advocating around um, uh, prevention and we know what the dilemma is. We've got resources trapped in the acute end and the challenge is, is, is to actually see a redistribution of our resources to be more focused and concentrated in, in early help. So we do keep our children and families out of the child protection, um, out of the youth justice system. Yeah, great. So we've got, um, we've finished the questions, um, but what we might do is, is the ones that I've been given aren't a, a huge amount. We might be able to somehow put them under the link um, and get them answered along the way so that we've got um, those there for people. I just want to thank um, the three commissioners for sharing their views with us today. And I know how busy you all are. And um, I think it's great that people can hear your point of views and also see your passion that we saw um, today. So thank you for your time. Um, and last year, a staggering 20,077 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children were in out-of-home care. And our children were removed from their families at a record rate of 13 children in every thousand. If we cannot radically change the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in care, this will more than double by 2029. Part of changing course requires being realistic about what it takes to create significant change to systems. It is time for us to acknowledge the past attempts at improving outcomes for our kids. They've failed in the past, so because no one has been held accountable. So a dedicated national commissioner and commissioners within each state and territory will be a big part of ensuring that government commitments are being implemented and that our children's rights are being protected. We need to ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children are kept connected to family, culture and community. With an overarching strategy and commissioner, we can make sure that there are national standards and practice across all jurisdictions to improve outcomes for our kids. So Snake and Family Matters are currently calling for uh, the Commonwealth Government to create a National Children's Commissioner role. You can find our position paper on the Family Matters website um, at familymatters.org.au, um, who's with us, supporters for a National Commissioner. So we're calling for the role to be established by uh, legislation to ensure independence and autonomy from government um, and for it to be adequately resourced. Um, we want the Commissioner's role to be identified by an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person with appropriate qualifications, knowledge and experience. And we want the role to be mandated with a clear scope and purpose for the role, with powers of inquiry and investigation to promote systemic change and accountability for our kids and families. Currently we have more, or we've got just on 200 organisations who have signed for our National uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Children's Commissioner. And if you'd like to join a call as an organisational signatory, we'll send the website link um, to all the attendees with a link to today's recording. 
And if you're interested in being a part of our campaign to end the overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in child protection and out-of-home care, there are plenty of ways to get involved. We're already planning our next National Week of Action for the campaign, which will be in May. And you can speak with our campaign team to organise an event at your own workplace or sign up to join the campaign at the Family Matters website. Once again, thank you to the commissioners for uh, taking the time. Thank you to the Family Matters Leadership Group, all speakers and attendees. And please remember to visit our Family Matters website and sign on to the call for the National Aboriginal Children's Commissioner. And you can actually download the latest. Uh, this is this is our new one. I've got my hands on it today, finally printed um, on our website as well. So the the Family Matters um, report, and it's and it's funny because a lot of what the commissioner spoke about is exactly what's in here. So um, thank you everybody for your time, um, and thank you commissioners. <laughs>